Hello everybody. We have entered week six of the eco-protest organized by Azerbaijani environmentalists on the Lachul Khan Kandir Road in the Karabakh economic region of Azerbaijan. The pressing question of the time relates to what has changed. In other words, what is different now about the illegal exploitation of Karabakh's natural resources that triggered the protest in the first place and regarding the way the Lachul Road functions. We also need to look at how the situation is now different for the Armenian residents of Karabakh, for their self-styled and discredited first minister of the separatist Ruben Vardanyan, and what bearing the eco-protest has so far had on the long-winded peace negotiations between Baku and Yerevan. Responding to these questions is key to having a fairly lucid idea as to where we are now. So let us examine them in turn. Firstly, as we know, the illicit extraction of the Kazilbulak gold and Damerli copper molybdenum resources of Karabakh by the Swiss base, base metal was halted. This is not a giant leap, but rather a considerable plunge, being to the credit of the eco-protesters. What has yet not been achieved is access to ecological monitoring by Azerbaijani experts in the zone under the temporary control of the Russian peacekeepers. And this remains the central demand of the demonstration. In addition, now we have the full list of foreign companies that illegally operate in the region. Legal consequences must and will follow. Secondly, something has significantly changed about the movement along the Lachul Road. If prior to the 12th of December 2022, the road, despite numerous warnings issued by Azerbaijani authorities, had been used in contravention of its humanitarian regime for myriad illegal purposes, including the transportation of illicitly extracted raw materials, mines, weapons, munitions. Now, the physical presence of the protesters on the ground has led this to be virtually curbed. But this is only virtually, not completely. We can't exclude recurrent instances of continuous misuse, for there is no permanent control by Azerbaijani authorities to date. One episode, in my view, perhaps deserves a special mention. On the 18th of January, three vehicles belonging to the Russian peacekeeping contingent, carrying 26 civilians, including 20 teenagers, passed through the Lachon Road totally unhindered, as was expected. Yet the Armenian media claimed that the protesters shouted at their passengers, intimidating them. Nothing of the sort took place. Trust the videos, not the convenient prejudice fantasies. Thirdly, it seems that there is no uniform view amongst the Armenians of Karabakh as to how their present contrived predicament should be communicated to the world. Interestingly enough, Ruben Vardanyan himself in a recent interview, dismantled the concept of alleged besiegement of the local residents due to the eco-protest, downplaying the severity of the situation. The Kremlin-backed tycoon stated that humanitarian aid was provided by the Russian peacekeepers and seriously ill patients were being transported out of the territory via the intervention of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Since it is self-evident that there is no humanitarian disaster in Khan Kandi and its outskirts, some Armenians now claim that it is simply abnormal that the residents of the region receive food supplies and other essentials by the Russian peacekeepers, and medical aid is provided by an international humanitarian organization, stipulating that the situation should be reversed to the pre-12th of December stage, being the date of the protest inception, as you know. Well, there is indeed abnormality, but it has not been caused by the indefatigable Azerbaijani environmentalists. Eco-protesters are there to fix the abnormality. They want to ensure beyond doubt that the nation's resources won't be plundered with impunity against international law and environmental standards. The abnormality is that Karabakh's Armenian residents are currently being held hostage to Vardanyan and his mafia-style henchmen and the separatists do not want vehicles entering Khan Kandi via the Lachun Road to be inspected by the Azerbaijani authorities as they wish to transport nefarious cargo. It is also abnormal that the Armenians of Karabakh should feel they are in limbo with the prospects of their integration into wide Azerbaijani society, facing an artificial challenge in the shape of a Russian billionaire of mendacious schemes and dubious pedigree. 
And when the denigrators of the eco-protest demand a reversion to the pre-protest state of affairs, they are effectively expressing a desire for the perpetuation of this abnormality, namely the use of the Lachun route for illegal purposes and unchecked exploitation of Azerbaijan's natural resources. On a different note, the situation around the Lachun road has considerably exacerbated frictions inside the illegal NKR, with Vardanya facing calls to resign. Alien to the local population of the region, viewed by Baku as a Moscow sent agent and treated with suspicion by the authorities in Yerevan, he was instrumental in derailing the nascent dialogue between Azerbaijan and its citizens of Armenian origin. Despite attempts to put on a brave face, he is beleaguered, out on a limb, and impacted by the increased perception that he is an irksome spoiler of the highest order. Fourthly, if the judge by Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan's latest 10th of January press conference and the recent statement by Alain Simonyan, the Speaker of the Armenian National Assembly, it is apparent that Yerevan believes Baku should directly talk to Khan Kandi. As usual, the devil is in the details and normally lives in the Kremlin. For Azerbaijan, the situation involving Karabakh Armenians is outside the interstate domain and therefore is not to be discussed with anyone, particularly external actors, the only permissible dialogue being with the representatives of the local community in the region. In this sense, there is perhaps, perhaps an emerging commonality between Baku and Yerevan. For all the confessions made by Pashinyan during the recent press conference to the effect that the recognition of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity is an inoxorability as otherwise Armenia would be against the logic of world order, he has not yet completely freed himself from the shackles of remedial secession hopes, which are still a corroded insert and semi-inert component in his negotiating position. The Armenian Prime Minister continues to act within the same parameters. To his local audience, he is compelled to explain how hopeless it is to deny the criticality of recognizing the Azerbaijani sovereignty over Karabakh, whereas his message to Baku is centered around the internal difficulties associated with agreeing with this without soliciting some treaty-based guarantees for the Armenians of the region. The probability is that he will continue to operate within the self-same parameters eventually ditching his reservations. All of this, in my view, cumulatively, form the very gist of the current situation in the context of the ongoing eco-protest. Many thanks and all the best to all of you, including our own Azerbaijani citizens of Armenian origin residing in Karabakh.